All right, friends, we are live on Facebook. We have a fun guest today, Isaiah McPeak. And if you are into things like communication, trust, building relationships, maybe even making more sales, I think Isaiah is really going to share some interesting topics and conversations with you. So listen, here's what we're doing. Isaiah is going to walk us through exactly how we build relationships, level up trust, so we can bridge that know, like, and trust gap so that we can absolutely have these amazing world-class relationships that become unstoppable. So I don't care if it's within a, a business or a company. I don't care if you're talking to clients or consumers. The same is true every single time. So we got to bridge those know, like, and trust and so, Isaiah, welcome to the Best Places to Lead show. Thank you for coming. And I'm excited for you to drop some knowledge on us. So glad to be here. And I'm ready to start whenever you are. Let's let's get this rolling. I know. I, see, I always go right into it because people are like, oh, people need introductions. I'm like, not really. No. If you're here, you're cool. So um, let's get right into this. So you have this whole process that you uh, have learned and developed and grown. How did you go about learning about leveling up relationships and you have a whole little diagram that you've used on this reciprocal leveling up of relationships tell us about it okay well it all started 2000 and some odd years ago this guy named aristotle wrote the book called rhetoric and i have been a student of classical rhetoric for uh, years and years i've i've been a high school speech and debate coach for about 19 years. And if you ask me what I really want to do, that's all I really want to do. Um, there's no money in it. So I do other things. And every other part of my life has been basically an expression of or application of high school speech and debate, which um, can happen in two ways, right? Right there, you probably don't trust me because I get a lot <laughs> of this whole, uh, you know, talk me out of abortion, talk me out of a uh, X, Y, Z, you know, pretend I'm a libertarian, whatever you want to talk about. And like, mm, that's not it. Um, because there's two kinds of force in this world. And that's where I learned a lot about trust. One kind is to beat down and dominate through communication. It requires you to wire your brain such that humans are objects or means to an end. There is another approach. And that approach is the rare approach in communication, but it puts listening first and it puts empathy first and it puts value first so that you treat others as ends in of themselves as opposed to means. And so there's this repositioning that happens where the debater, the communicator, the salesperson, the executive goes from being Luke Skywalker as they have these skills to no, 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 they're Yoda. The audience, the other person is Luke Skywalker. And there's a whole treasure trove of classical rhetoric skills that have been developed over 2000 ish years that have collided with brain science and behavioral design in the more modern era and also collided with well being research. And they all say the same thing. And so I've partnered for the last about six years with my mentor, Stephen Tomlinson, here in Austin, Texas, who has pioneered bringing those tactics and techniques into the executive boardroom uh, and into sales teams. And we train them in the same skill sets used in therapy, improv, and a wide variety of uh, effective me means of communication all built on trust. So that's the really long how how I started how to get here. interested and got these things. And, you know, I feel like I'm more of like a synthesizer of these things than as much a generator of them. And the yep. more I learn, the more like, oh my gosh, this research already existed. Oh, this knowledge is already here. I, what in the world is going on in our businesses that we're all a bunch of broken copy machines copying terrible sales tactics that immediately put the guard up. You know, well, so like, I want to roll this back, right? Because I look at our previous president, 
right? Whether you like them, you don't like them, Republican, Democrat, put all of those things aside. I think the approach that he had, which was very much not listening, plowing forward, having his own agenda, I think that was very much the last generation of leaders. And the things that you're talking about, um, man, coincide with really the last 10 years that I have seen, but a kinder, gentler, more purpose-oriented, more purpose-driven environment where you have to lead. You have to come from purpose. You have to come from value. Have you seen that, Isaiah, as you've done your studying and research, bringing um, you know, these things forward into today's age? Yes. Um, so I would even say that that's true in what I've seen in parenting. And I'm no expert in any of these subjects to, to be candid. Um, I studied strategic intelligence and watch and synthesize information. And my opinions are about as good as nothing when it comes to being an expert in anything. Um, but I noticed these trends and I think so much of it has to do with the information age. And it's kind of gone are the days where you don't have to be accountable for what you say or do. And so, um, you, you end up learning together as a society, things like, Hey, maybe it doesn't really help kids to just tell them what to do all day or tell them they're stupid for not doing what you did back in your day. But that same generation of leaders that's passing away grew up that way and parent that way. And well, bring that way of being to a lot of ways of life. And that's why things like Toastmasters catch on. Let's get perfect. Let's dominate in our communication style. And I'm not even going to be self-aware that everybody who already agreed with me still agrees with me and they're super excited. But because I called everybody else who doesn't agree with me a stupid idiot, I didn't change a single mind. And I think that describes the last presidency, most of our television, and a lot of bad parenting. Plus social media, where there's zero and accountability. Sales. <laughs> yep. And sales. <laughs> and, and sales. I, I think it is interesting, right? And so, like, I look at the, the Edelman Trust Report. 61% of people are now choosing companies based around purpose and alignment of values and what mm -hmm. social good they're creating. And so if companies aren't thinking in this way of building relationships, communicating it really well, and then therefore building trust because trust comes out of, you know, credibility yeah. and doing what you say you're going to do. Um, walk me through the process. Like, how do you develop trust? Because we had Robin Dreek on the show. I think it was about episode 15 or 18. Maria, maybe if you can um, drop that in the chat. And he was an FBI counterintelligence spy. I mean, he recruited mm -hmm. spies from the mm -hmm. other side to, to come over to our side. And we talked all about trust and it was super interesting. So give us like the brass tacks of what you've learned of how you level up relationships, how you build trust. If I share my screen here, will that, will that work with all the socials and things we're broadcasting on? Um, so it should. And, you know, what I would say is just make sure that when you're referencing the diagram, just make sure that you are walking people through what yep. it is that you're talking about. Because if they're listening to a podcast, then we need to make it visual for them. And I would just say, I've done a number of episodes where I've used slides and the best place to go experience that is over on YouTube. Perfect. Then I, I'll explain this diagram as I build it up and you get to be the guide who, who tells me, go this way, that way, what's going on here. I like to think of trust um, and, and anything that I say here is learned. So let's just be real clear. I'm stealing, borrowing, uh, whatever from somebody else and th synthesizing that together. I like to think of trust as depth. So I like a vertical line and the deeper your trust, the more you can do with a relationship because trust is about successive risk taking. When you have more trust, someone will take a deeper risk with you. So it, on the left side of the line, I'll put a them. And on the right side of the line, I'll put an us. And we might say, Hi, my name's Isaiah. How are you doing today? And you've taken a risk to pass the mic. And they say, well, that wasn't so bad. They just said their name and they say, um, my name's Jerry and I'm having an okay sort of day. It's like a Monday on a Thursday though. 
and you toss back the mic. And I say, yeah, what's going on? I tossed it back. Oh, it's safe to toss the mic back and forth with Isaiah because he's not going to take 15 minutes every time I do that. I might tell him what's really going on. And I'll say, well, uh, we're having some medical issues at home and work's been really hard with also uh, getting the kids to and from their activities and doctor's visits. So frustrating that uh, they're only open during business hours. Oh, yeah. And we're having a conversation that's already getting deeper. We're talking about each other's families and so on. But if I start with a brand new stranger named Jerry and I say, hi, my name's Isaiah. I have kids who are 13, 9, and 1. Tell me about your family. Now, it's the same exact place we're in in the conversation, but we didn't have the foundation of risk taking yet so far that justifies that next successive risk to take with us. And so it's inappropriate in that level of the relationship. So what we have to do here, and I picked this up from Stephen Tomlinson, is I like to think of this as a trust bank. We are either depositing or withdrawing from that trust bank. And if we want to get deeper, then we need to make more deposits that make sense so that we can ask for the risk that makes sense way down here. And that applies to every personal relationship you have and every business relationship you want to have. Isaiah, I think you have just uncovered why I was unsuccessful in my dating years of speaking to women at 1.30 in the morning. And I, I just leveled it up too fast. Where'd your wife go on this call? I want to ask her about that. <laughs> That's right. Level I, I don't know anything about those 1.30 calls. So um, I'm just going to just leave that right there. <laughs> so, sounds like Jerry learned what he needed to. Um, so I exactly, like what what type of interaction do we have, give, or expect from our vendors? You know, are they going to take three days to respond to us? Then that changes the dynamic. Are they going to be right on top of us, hounding us? Well, that also changes the dynamic. And so we have to be looking at those things. And uh, there there are three gates we're passing on this depth chart, as it were. And this is going to connect to what you were just saying about, I, I, I can't help it. I'm just huge, not a fan of baby boomer mentality. Um, so I'm, I'll just say it. I'm a millennial whippersnapper. Um, <laughs> empathy, curiosity, and insight. The three gates of trust that uh, my mentor talks about and we like to help people understand how it's not very helpful to go through the last gate first, which is to land an insight. Nobody wants to hear your solution if they don't feel understood. We have to get to the point where they think we're on the same side of the table with them, looking at the same problems together instead of dominating us across the table. And then we can hand them a puzzle piece because we're both playing puzzle from the same side. And all of a sudden, that insight seems safe, worth considering, and we're going to look at it together in a certain way because there's a trust dynamic going on where if we don't go through the empathy and curiosity gates, which help us know what kind of person you are, and how you understand them, then our guard is in already up by default. We are on guard by default against people who haven't taken the time to understand us or probe and get to know us. So I think that's the, the whole point of like pushy salespeople. They're on their agenda. There is no curiosity. There is no empathy to get to know you. It is, I have a goal that I'm driving towards and be damned in the relationship. Therefore, you never get to the place of insight and problem statement solution. Yes. That's right. A hundred percent. So why, why do people suck at this so bad? I mean, it seems be like we, we talked a little bit about this in the, in the pre-call, right? The whole notion of, I love uh, Servant Leadership by Robert, Robert Greenleaf, mm -hmm. and it occurred to me while I was reading that book in college of servant selling, right? Yes. The whole notion of the salesperson, not as helper, but as forcer upon her of, 
whatever their solution is right. to be to be whether it's good for you or not they're going to sell you and that's what they're supposed to do and that's the way companies wind you up to do that and you know the way i conceptualized that was well shouldn't there be servant selling Mm -hmm. To understand what the needs are, just like you understand the needs of your people and you meet the needs of your people because you come from a place of service. It's the same thing with selling. And so if I say to you, oh, Isaiah, I've, I've heard what your needs are because I've been empathetic and curious, and I don't have the right insight or solution for you, then passing you off is 100% the right thing to do. And yet people can't resist the temptation of continuing to sell them when I don't have the right solution. And, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. How, how do you how do you get people back to that place other than, you know, training and giving people frameworks to understand how to do this better? Well, there there are two thoughts that I'm having. And one is I like to work with founders of companies and help teach them some of these techniques because they they typically don't believe they can sell their product. That they have to hire some professional salesperson. And why is that? When I dig in, I find the primary reason is sales is a dirty word. And most of us believe that if we have to sell something, we have to adopt a way of being that few of us are comfortable with. There's a certain level of hubris we just don't have. So we're going to go find somebody who has that and make them sell this product that we made for people. But when you learn that there's a completely different hallway to walk down for these skills, then you start to wire yourself as a value creator, right? That's the servant part. Oh, I see value here. Yeah, of course they need this because I made it for them. And the reasons that I made for them are conditions that are true. So there's value to be had. But you know, even the name itself, sales, sort of assumes this outcome that the other people buy your crap. And the idea of value creation in the first place is that they they have a need before the solution and that's you know it's pretty basic but you'll see sales bros say to each other oh yeah yeah sell to pain sell to need why should you ever have to tell each other to find a need before you pitch something but that's what sales has become. And so we have people on the other side of it thinking that that's what you're supposed to do. But then you go and find these top salespeople in the world. And most of us know one or two of them. They have completely opposite playbooks. Hold on, Isaiah. I, I see at least four of them on this call. I guarantee that none of the people on this call call 80 cold calls a day, hawking wares that they don't believe in, and telling themselves, it's a numbers game. It's a numbers game. Guarantee it. It's funny. One of my best friends works inside of uh, uh, several um, high-performing tech companies in the sales department. And after going to three different ones and talking about some of this, one day he said, you know, Isaiah, I've realized now, I thought this was just the first company I was at, but all the companies I'm at so far the cold calls thing is something that executives or sales ops people, which is another way of saying people who don't want to sell anymore, um, they have quotas for us to do this activity that they think produces results. And we have to pretend it produces results, but all the real deals are done through relationships. And they're done another way. And so we all have Rolodexes of numbers that we just call and we have our phone call them and things to log the call so that we can go do the real work of selling place after place after place. I think it comes back to no like, and trust, right? And so yes. keep talking us through how you get to that place of empathy, curiosity, insight, right? How, how do you, yeah. you know, establish that whole notion of, you know, objective approach result in walking through leveling up the relationship? So, so here, we're going to have a little, a little force diagram instead of one person coming from the left to the right and the other person from the right to the left and exploding in the middle as the idea of communication or landing, what we want to be able to do is both go the same direction. So how do we match pace with someone else and find where they're going 
Now we're starting to activate hero's journey and hand them the lightsaber they need on the way to get where they're going better, faster, cheaper, whatever. That's the key question. And so that question has to do with value propositions. And a value proposition isn't that complicated, but it gives us a clue into what it is that we're trying to discover. So we are trying to discover with them where there's value to be had. And that looks like a problem statement, which is their world. That's the key here. Where we're everything I teach has them first kind of in the subject line, their problem statement to where when you say it, even though your marketing team and your sales team all said, yeah, this is the problem they'll have. The way you said it to them sounds like them and they lean forward and they say, that's right. They don't say, oh yeah, that's true. We find a way that it sounds like them in their world and it's emotional. And they go, that's right. And then, and only then, will we have earned enough trust because we see their problem as clear as they do and maybe clearer to land an insight with them. And that's, we've found by doing it this other way that something better happens. What is that better? It's back to their world, which is the benefit. And by and large, this is story in a nutshell. They have a problem and can't get to a full amount of benefit, but if we give them the lightsaber in the middle, now they can get the benefit. That's the idea of value proposition, problem statement, insight, benefit. And so this is a lot of implications ranging from the best sales emails in the world are one sentence problem statement, one sentence insight, one sentence benefit. What questions do you have for me? And start a back and forth, not a 15 minute meeting, not nothing like that. Just here, I think this is the world that you're in. And this is a way it could be better. Curious? To what are we trying to do on these sales calls? And that's where I'm going to pull up the fun magical grid. Uh, we call it the discovery wheel. And it's where we try to figure out from the very top, what objective are they working on? This is the problem statement generating machine, which is the start of that value proposition we were just talking about. So our sales discovery calls, if they follow this wheel that I've got up, which I'm going to tell everyone what it is, if you're listening auditorily right now, it starts with objective and moves to approach and then around. And I'll, I'll explain some of these as we go. But the idea is a lot of people will start at the wrong part of this discovery wheel. And they'll start with like, here's what you could do. Okay, but what are they actually trying to do? Let's get on some common ground first. And when you proceed in a very specific order, it's always free in the trust bank. When you pounce, which means jump ahead in the conversation, you're making a withdrawal from the trust bank. So somebody might even call us sometimes and say, hey, I'm looking for a widget. Uh, have you, I, I've heard you have widget. And you can say, Yep, we've got it. What's the price? This. No, we want to back up and figure out what they're trying to do with the widget. If we don't know what they're trying to do, then we don't actually know if it's valuable yet. So these are some of the questions. Oops, I've got some other stuff uh, showing up. Whatever. Uh, I'll tell you some of the questions. Um, my, my templates are a little junked right now. That we go through, we might say, um, yeah, okay, but what are you trying to do with the widget? Well, I've been told to look for more widgets by our executives. Oh, yeah, what are they trying to do? I think they're trying to X, Y, Z. Okay, what's their current approach to that? And we start going around the wheel. So a real conversation might look like this. Uh, let me think. Well, I'm building a product right now. It's a legal tech product in the um, attorney deposition space. I might say, um, what kinds of operational efficiencies is your law firm bringing to uh, depositions and court reporting right now? And they might say, nothing. And then I might say, 
um, how important is it to pass on lower costs to your clients? And they might say, well, that's super important there. Okay. Now I've got an objective to work with. How are you lowering costs in the court reporting and deposition space? And they might say, well, we're not, we just pay whatever the bill is. As you know, those costs have been skyrocketing. Yeah, I'm seeing $300 an hour being rock bottom and an average is a lot closer to $600 an hour for court reporters to send you something three weeks later. Yeah, it's really frustrating and sometimes they don't show up. Mm -hmm. And so we're moving around from objective to their approach to the results they're getting. Now that was a pretty pliable example, but that's what I'm working on right now in our product. And we keep going around. What challenges are they having with their current uh, uh, approaches to meeting that objective? And then in an ideal world, what would that look like? Well, it would be magical if we got the transcript the same day that we had the deposition. Yeah. Uh, what ideas have you had so far? Maybe they've had some, maybe they haven't. And then the final question that gets us to be able to land a problem statement is this magical question. And what difference would that make for you? And instead of you guessing, just let the customer say, well, if we could achieve that, then we wouldn't have to do this other thing. I wouldn't have to hire these people. We would get to enter that market. We, whatever it is, they're going to tell you what it means to get their objective better. And now you have earned enough trust to land a problem statement. And you can say, it sounds like you're experiencing the increasing hassles and delays of the court reporting industry and are victim to court reporters more than anything else. And they'll lean into the phone and say, that's right. Now, what are they ready for? I've earned enough trust to see it from their side of the table. And I can now hand them one puzzle piece, which is my insight. We found that by customizing Zoom, the platform everybody's already using, you can eliminate the job of the court reporter with seven little innovations of software. Now they're going to ask me to tell them more. And we're on to where we want to be as salespeople, which is describing what our product is and does and how it works. So let's roll this back. Right? Mm -hmm. I love frameworks because you can point to like, all right, I'm missing here. I haven't gotten this mm -hmm. piece. And so they're predictable, they're, they're scalable, mm -hmm. and they bring um, results. So how, how do you go through this, right? I, I mean, how do you know that you're ready to move to the next step? Because a lot of these are just conversations. How do you know when to level up, when to take a step back? Oh, I tested that. It's not, yeah. that doesn't seem to be working. So let me try something else. I mean, what does that look like? There, there are three rules of engagement that, that tell you, and they're real simple. The first one is you only make one point per turn. Mm. When I practice this with sales folks, like the call I just had before, we, we play a silly game sometimes. I call it executive chess. Infinite think time. Then you get to say one thing as a question or a statement and you're done. Now they say something, then you get infinite think time and it's real fun to watch because the other participants on the call will say that was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And the salesperson I'm working with will say, but there was a lot of awkward silence. And I'll ask the other people, how awkward was that silence? And I'm like, it wasn't awkward. You were both thinking actually before you spoke next. And that reduced the tension of all this and let you adapt. So one point per turn is the, the first rule. And the second is to follow the clues. That sounds obtuse. So let me give you a clear example. We're going to look for the hot word. Um, Jerry, I'm really excited to talk about the business you're building today. What's the hot word in what I just said? 
Jerry, I'm bit. really excited to talk Excit to you about the bill. Yeah. Excited. And I could flip that around and say, Jerry, I'm really frustrated with how it's been to work with you lately. Frustrated. Most of us have a tendency to reply instead of follow. They've just told us what they want to speak about if there's a hot word in there. And so if I say, hey, Jerry, I'm really excited uh, about where you're going with your business. Instead of you saying, oh, yeah, it's been so awesome to X, Y, Z, you would say, what's got you excited? And now I will tell you. And if I say I'm super frustrated with, with I'm super frustrated blah, blah, blah. Instead of saying, oh, we're really good at solving problems. We work through, you know, we always make it right or something like that, which is a reply. Just try frustrated. And I'll tell you, well, this and that has been happening. Now you don't have to guess before you answer. So we follow those clues, hot words, as we go around that wheel and we'll realize if we've overstepped because we can follow the clue that gets us back to where we need to go. Interesting. And what I'm hearing is the emotion words, excited, frustrated, right? Like That's right. All, all of that, pulling that out, the hot button. Yes. Find that hot button and usually they will tell you where they want to go. Interesting. <clears throat> Just rolling that back, Isaiah. Yeah. We had um, Park Howell on the show two weeks ago and he did a great job. And one of the things he talked about was you can only solve one problem at a time. Yes. And one of the things that we see from leaders is we and the heck out of something and this, and we're faster shipping and we're this, and we're fat lower price and we're this. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, no, no. You have to pick the one narrative that is most important so that you can create that, at least on the on entryway into the process. Now, obviously, you can do a better job of that as you're um, moving through it and, and, um, and having conversations with someone to understand the nuances of what's important mm -hmm. to them. But to your point, the whole notion of and 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 and, and which I find most people do because mm -hmm. they want to, they want to have the universe of possibilities available yep. to them. And hopefully one of these will stick for the person that I'm speaking to. How much do you trust someone who's unwilling to commit to their position? Um, a lot. Slippery. Slippery. We want to see to develop trust that somebody is willing to say one thing and stick to it. But what's funny about that is when you play by these rules, you can change. So connecting that back to the discovery wheel, one of the most important toolkits for any salesperson is they usually have multiple value propositions available to them. The discovery process helps us know which one will be impactful. So instead of showing up to a call and saying this saves you time and money and makes your life better, we have to pick our best theory and explore it. But if they reject it, we go to the other one and it might be the right theory. So I'll give you a clear example of what we're selling. Um, defense attorneys and plaintiff's attorneys don't have the same value proposition because plaintiff's attorneys take the risk on themselves. They only get paid if they win. Whereas the defense attorneys get to bill their client no matter what happens, same hourly rate. So I have to pursue this objective differently. Now, how did I get to that point? Lots of discovery calls, actually my co-founder mostly, but um, I can now enter the call with a couple good theories if I'm talking to a defense attorney and I can say, how important is it that your clients believe You've efficiently handled their claim. And I might hear an answer like, well, that's everything. That's how we get referrals. Or I might hear an answer like, it's somewhat important, which tells me it's not. And then I shift gears and I say, what kind of hassle has the court reporting industry been 
since you went online with Zoom depositions and then their eyes might light up and they say, it's crazy that I have to pay a videographer to mash a record button. I'm like, gotcha. I know that there's an objective here that we can see, right? So we might test a few different directions early to know which value proposition loop is worth exploring with them. I think this is so interesting, right? So you, you have to know your service or your product. You have to know your customer. So like I'm looking at Kurt Thomas, who works mm -hmm. at a high growth company. And one of his quarterly objectives is to speak to their 60 reps in the marketplace to make sure that they are meeting the needs and that what they're putting out there is actually resonating. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the things that I think is so, so interesting. I, I, I have recently started asking all of my marketing leaders, when is the last time you've spoke to one of our customers? And it's amazing how the person who's leading the messaging has not spoken to our customers or people that we've closed lost and said, oh, well, our messaging didn't resonate there. What do we need to do to tweak? And so coming in, you know, are you coming in with a scalpel? Or are you coming in with a sledgehammer? Mm -hmm. And I think you have to be surgical in your understanding of your product, what you're doing and how you're doing it. Cause it's not one size fits all. I, I love what you just said. And I think if, if Kurt's doing what I think he's doing and Kurt, feel free to jump in here in a second, then there's an important call in there called the demo call and the scalpel version and the, um, sledgehammer version are very different. Here's the sledgehammer uh demo call is slides or click through long it's a product walk through i just said everything and here's the scalpel version i don't know how to draw a good scalpel but that's my best version right there <laughs> um it goes like this uh what are you most interested in seeing Sometimes you might have a prospect with less. They're like, I saw your thing online. Yeah, what caught your eye? I got an email from you. What was interesting enough to get on a call with me? We have to ask that question to find interest. That's the only way to get us going on the same path. And then they say, well, I, I, I guess I was intrigued by your file storage. Tell me more. This and that. Let's see how the file storage works. Click to our file storage, show exactly that. Let me ask them a question. What about that caught your eye? How interesting was that? How valuable did that seem? Those sorts of questions. And then based on their feedback, we'll know exactly what to do next. At no point do we have to show them every part of our product. Instead, we show them exactly what they're interested in, in the exact order in which it's interesting. And I'll give you another example before I let Kurt jump in and interrupt me a bunch and, and tell me it's wrong, um, which is uh, uh, venture capital pitches work the same way. There's this idea in our head that we walk in and we deliver 10 slides. That's the sledgehammer version. Here's how to show up like an executive. We have one of the best timed opportunities in legal tech today. If you buy that market, then you know you need to be making a bet there. We're the best bet to make because Zoom's our partner and they already have 77% of the market share. My slide deck has every slide you'd expect it to have. Where would you like to start? So my slides are random access memory to a conversation that I want to have instead of a sledgehammer that I'm going to beat people with into submission while their mind goes another direction. So this scalpel version is interesting because it requires the other person to get on the dance floor within 90 seconds. There's no passive listening. And that'll either get them off your call fast because they're not a real prospect, or it'll get them activated to where they're pushing you to discover value. All right, I talked and talked and talked. Kurt, I can see you're there. What, what of this is interesting or landing for you on the... Uh, demos thing yeah absolutely um i think 
a lot of my conversations, um, I don't bring in one thing at a time. I kind of started off, introduce myself, ask them four things, and then we work through our conversation. So I think uh, whenever I do ask four things at once, you know, a lot of times they'll only grab onto one and we kind of miss the other ones. We don't get to go in depth. So um, yeah, this is, this is honestly one of my first approaches to really getting in depth with our customers, building that relationship. So I wish we had this, uh, this video before I started this journey, but, um, I still got a third left. So <laughs> better late awesome. than ever. I, I, th I do think it's interesting, Isaiah, cause you know, I've been, I've been doing a show for six months and I mean, I'm, I'm pretty good at talking on the fly. But one thing that I've learned is trying to be a craftsman at being a good interviewer is to ask one question at a time. It is not a complex and, 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 because, well, which one do you want me to answer? It has to be one question and shut the heck up. And, you know, I think salespeople historically have been given, quote unquote, Leanne is great because she has, she has the gift of gab. And it's like, well, is it really the gift of gab that we need from our sales leader? Or is it people who are amazing listeners and can constantly just flow and redirect the conversation back and forth to get us to the end where we can make that problem statement? I, I think what you just said is brilliant because it's also connected to that shift that we're seeing generationally right now, where I think we, in the early 2000s, People were going to Toastmasters because they had never spoken publicly before. Most of us are used to the type of speaking we do most of the time anymore. We're used to being on Zoom calls, that kind of thing. And so the emphasis on skill has shifted enough where I can say this now that I was saying then and people gave me blank stares. Um, expression is not communication. We too often put the most expressive people into these customer facing roles because they like to talk, but communication isn't saying words. I'll bite. What is it then? It's visiting their island and getting them to act. So I like to think of it as activation, right? If, if you get on a call with me and I say, why are we here? In so many words, you know, what brought you to this call today? I'm going to, I'm going to shut my mouth and watch and see what you say. And now we're already started. I visited your Island and wanted to know what was interesting to you. And if you said, my boss sent me here, that sounds like a kiss of death, but it's not. I'm going to say, what does your boss care about? And we're going to have the right discussion for the time. So we're working at all times on the communication being a connected thing where we're doing this dance with them instead of to them. Yes. Engagement. It's so critical. I think Carrie, Carrie Dilly had a great question, right? So when you look at the framework, you know, typically salespeople are thinking about who, what, when, why, and how. Mm -hmm. And so how does that fit into this play when, are you looking at that like before, are you looking at that during, are you looking at that after so that you can establish the context and the delivery of the problem statement? You're filling those things out during. So the problem with who, what, when, why, and how is those are buckets that end up filled at the end of one of these conversations, but the way you fill them isn't one at a time in a super linear fashion. We don't first say, all right, who all is involved in this? Because we haven't earned enough trust to ask that question. We don't first go with, why are you all doing it this way? Or what's the real why here? We have to build little pieces that establish that through a lot of information. And then it sort of sorts itself out into those buckets. So the buckets are filled over the course of the conversation, um, but they're not filled by 
speaking directly to them each time. You almost have to be a sleuth. Listening, yeah. questioning, synthesizing, listening, questioning, synthesizing, rinse and repeat. That's right. And so the, the third rule I want to get up here and then be done with the, uh, dropping framework stuff here is open prompts or open questions. Closed questions, classic in sales playbooks though, start with words like is, do, would, would it be okay if, um, is this something you're experiencing? That's just fishing on your own agenda. An open approach changes those from yes, no questions to more like Likert scale questions. They have a lot of direction they could go and you're not forcing them into one. So you say, how, what, where. You can also make statements like we've found or other sorts of open prompts that just leave uh, uh, leave something on the table they can react to. So you might say instead of, um, do you all struggle with the amount of systems inside of your business? Just change it to an open prompt by saying, how has the environment of systems in your business been going for you? Or what have you all found as you scaled are problems with the amount of systems you have? Things like that. Open up for them to say a story instead of to say yes, and then you proceed to the next thing on your sales agenda that you're doing to them. Interesting. And that works for your interviewing as well. I'm sure you already are a pro at this because you've been doing it for months. Uh, I find that I fall into bad habits sometimes of like, well, do you ever experience this? And then I'm like, dang it. I, I want to ask how, ha what has your experience of this been? And now I get the story. I'm trying to work really hard out at Isaiah. It's been a six month journey and uh, it's been super interesting, but yeah, I, I'm a, I'm a craftsperson, but I'm bumbling at it and trying to get better at it every day, which is why everyone here is trying to get better at it too. One of the things that we had um, talked about was being able to like, you know, bring anyone on who, whether they have a, a new sales conversation, delivering bad news, a, any of those things to kind of role play with you to help them with getting prepared for that conversation. Are, are you good with that? I'd love to do that. Yeah. So I know Craig is uh, a new salesperson and Craig, I'd love to hear from you how you're doing, making those, you know, initial contacts because Craig is a career switcher, a former principal and now in sales, which I think, by the way, you're, as a principal, you're in sales to begin with, but I would love to hear from, from you the conversations, how they're going, and maybe anything that you can do to um, pick Isaiah's brain to help you move forward in your career. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. So how you doing, Isaiah? Uh, like Jerry said, I, I just made a switch from a 14-year uh, public education career, an elementary school principal, to a institutional account manager. And right now, I'm in like my first 30 intro visits. And my sole focus has been going in and just trying to understand like who they are as people, how long they've been doing their role. And then through that organically, it's just been trying to find out like what their challenges are in there. Um, and I, I haven't even started the pitch yet um, because they're already existing customers. It's really just been about like who they are, what their role is and, and um, what they look for in a rep. So my questions when I go in are always how long have they been doing it, um, try and get to understand like what their role actually looks like. And then I ask, what do they typically look for in a rep? Um, but I'd love to hear what other intro ideas you have just to kind of start that trust building relationship process. Thanks, Craig. Uh, th this is fantastic. May I ask real quick, at the end of the day, what will you be uh, responsible for selling or facilitating to these folks? So ultimately, I, I'm 
hoping to get them over to a direct contract with us right now. So right now they're, they're purchasing some of our supplies off of another wholesaler. So eventually mm -hmm. I would like to get them on, uh, to increase what they purchase through the wholesaler and then ultimately onto a direct contract with our um, sister company. Mm -hmm. and, and what's the core value of, or, or product you all provide? Uh, so it's um, medical supplies, unit dose. Great. This is funny because I've been working with a medical supplies company um, recently for, I've trained about a hundred of their key account managers. So I was just this week training two in the exact conversation you're having of they're the new representative making a new relationship. And what I pulled up was this strategy board. So the discovery wheel that we were looking at could be appropriate if you wanted to really get an understanding of their strategic initiatives and where they're going uh, to be able to align with that. That may still be a good model, but I like to follow those tactics with this strategy board here when I actually have an objective in mind. The objective being something that they could say yes to. And your, your yes right now is just feedback on what it means to be an effective representative to them. You want to know what that is. I'm going to, I'm going to tighten that up a little bit. And I'm going to say, I recommend that you, your objective is to, to establish a cadence and relationship. You don't want to leave that call open-ended. You want to leave that call with the next time that you're going to discuss or the next touch point that you're going to have fair. Yeah. So that's, I've been telling them when I leave that I'll be seeing them within the next three to four months that my goal is once a quarter. And we talk about times of year that typically like works the best for them and they're, they're busy times. If that didn't work the best for them, would you have, what would you do? So then my option right now has been really just to say as much as I like the in-person, um, these have all been in-person visits. Um, but I say as much as I like in-person, if it doesn't work there, maybe we can schedule a quick uh, virtual or phone call. How many in-persons can you do in a year? Uh, so I'm on the first month of this. And right now I'm getting between eight and 10 per week. Um, but I'd, I'd like to ultimately increase that. But I'm, I'm kind of learning my way through right now. But right now I've been averaging about eight to 10 in-persons a week. Per account, how many in-persons can you do a year? There's really no set number i have roughly 360 accounts that i mm. that i in, in my territory okay perfect the reason i'm asking you those questions is because as you craft your intent for them what does it mean to good be a good sales rep i'm not certain that you want to give them all the options for what it means to give be a good sales rep because you've got some constraints so let's craft together the opening line of these calls or meetings as a generous intention that you have for them. And this to me is what uh, I always use in a tough negotiation or an easy intro call. So at the end of it all, I want to be able to say what's in it for them that I have in mind here, because if I can latch to that value for them, then no amount of anger, sidetracking or weirdness can throw me off of I'm here to create value for them. And I'm going to find a creative way to land that. So what's the value for them? So for, for us right now, um, if we're talking like exclusively unit dose, it's eliminating human error. Um, and it's, it's also time is money, um, which most of the, the buyers already know that. Um, but just in my brief time in the field, you, you know, the number one thing you hear is that people are struggling with back orders. Um, which will eventually lead to the idea of pushing um, the, the direct because it opens up to more options for them and more availability for product. Mm -hmm. So you want to help them how? By extent, one, by trying to uh, reduce the amount of money that they're, they're spending currently, if we can ever find value for them. Um, and then also eventually just broaden the amount of products that are available to them because you know, their, their patients' lives are dependent on it. And, and right now they're borrowing from other facilities in their networks, um, but ultimately want to get them to have a direct supply with us and our wholesale. Mm -hmm. How fair does this sound? Hi, I 
am here to help craft our relationship to reduce your spend and eliminate costly mistakes. It's a lot better than what I've been saying. Right now, I tell them that uh, I'm going from principal to drug dealer is my opening line. So I think you're the little <laughs> uh, what I've been using. I like yours because it's funny. And I think I like it's, it. it's, it's good to put in at some point. The only thing that I would draw your attention to is what we were saying earlier is always start with them. We want to have something that's them focused that they assent to and makes that conversation downhill and from the same side of the table. So nothing that I just said isn't something you said. It just is from their perspective first. And then you get to, you get to make your drug dealer joke uh, at some point in there. Uh, definitely a good one to make. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks, Isaiah. I really appreciate it. You bet. So then to work with me really quickly, what is the top concern or challenge you expect from them? So far, the, the number one concern that, that I hear from them is, is product back order um, is, mm -hmm. is the number one issue. And just supply chain issues is, are, are the two that come to the forefront. And I'm I literally had meetings 21, 22, and 23 today. So I'm, I'm relatively new in this, but that, that's mm -hmm. been the biggest uh, challenge that I've heard. And what do they need to understand and believe about you and your company to increase their trust on that issue? Uh, so in casual conversation, it, it kind of came up um, that they want to know that we have their best interests in mind and that you know they've had experiences where companies sell them products not even paying to try to sell them products that don't even pertain to what type of facility they are so mm -hmm. if they're a behavioral the one specific example was somebody from a behavioral um institute they were trying to be sold a medication that didn't even pertain to to them so they they want to know that we have their best interests at heart mm -hmm. now let's think about what is an open-ended prompt we can use to help them make this discovery on their concern? So I guess, I know, so I haven't given this piece of it a, a ton of thought because honestly, some of the feedback that I, I've i got from some of my peers and, and that I've already been seeing is like not to push this too quickly. So right now, my sole emphasis has been on relationship building and I haven't even, I haven't even got to that point with them. In fact, like the direct conversation came up in a in a meeting yesterday um but i didn't even want to push it yet because i still wanted to nurture that relationship before i felt like it was pushing it sooner than it needed to so i, I really haven't got to that point yet to be honest with you not like jerry calling at 1 30 in the morning I'm, I'm trying to slow play slightly here and uh, and, and build up that sense of trust oh, you know <laughs> carrie dilly told me oh, always be closing Always be closing. It's just what I was told. Here's a couple prompts that I, I want to run by you, Craig. And if they're not comfortable, I want to know. What's your current level of trust with our company? Too much? No, I think that's appropriate. What kinds of relationships have you all got that are trustworthy? Fair? Yeah, that, that actually sounds more me. Mm -hmm. How can I build the most trust the fastest what do you think i like that one but i also i worry about that one where it goes back to that notion you talked about earlier where it, it seems more forward and and pushy uh like there is mm -hmm. an agenda as opposed to just truly like nurturing that relationship mm -hmm. what do i need to know to put your best interest first i like that one how has past product availability affected our relationship. How about that? Yeah, I like that as well. Okay. My suggestion to you, Craig, is that these types of questions are directly related to what you feel like you haven't gotten into that much. And they're exactly the intention that you have, which is you're trying to build this relationship so that you can help reduce spin and stuff. And what I want everyone on the call to see is the power in this kind of approach is that you give all the power to them. And so it's a lot easier to ask certain questions or broach certain topics, because if they want to shy away from it, they'll just shy away from it. And so we can go ahead and get deep pretty quickly 
because we're playing our side of the trust line like a boss. We're able to say, what what things do I need to know to put your trust first or uh, to put your best interest first? And they can trust me at a shallow level or a deep level with their response. They might say, well, we need you to be responsive and timely. And then you can say, what's that look like? And you can just talk about that. That's fine. That's where they, they're at with you. They might say, Craig, last year was a disaster. Blah, 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 blah. They might trust you a whole lot all of a sudden. And you get to answer and deal with that and say, let's make sure that doesn't happen again. Help me build that plan for you. You don't know which way it'll go. These, the idea is usually we want to pitch them what they need to understand and believe. And what I like about this board that we've got up is we plan their concern and challenge that we expect, what we would answer if we could. But then instead of doing that, we come up with prompt questions or statements that help them get there and choose what we normally would have pitched in the first place. And that gets them to yes a whole lot faster and a whole lot more of their energy involved in whatever we decide to do together. So if you really want to have fun now, Craig, let's just do this. I'm going to put on my hat of your client. Tell me what I'm like, and let's have a three-minute call. You know, Jerry, I was literally getting ready to say I'm heading to back to school night, and you threw me right into it now. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing awesome, Craig. I'm yeah. impressed for one month in, 20 meetings in, how well you've responded. So keep it up. Show Isaiah what you're made of, bud. All right, let's do it, Isaiah. Okay, tell me who I am real quick so that I can give you a reliable playing partner. So you are pharmacy buyer um, mm -hmm. for a, a small hospital that has between 100 and 200 bed count. Supply chain? Uh um, or, or clinical? Will, uh, we'll say clinical. Great. All right. All right. So this is our first meeting. Is that how we're going? This is our first meeting and you get to play with these rules. So you can slow it down and play that executive chess. I want you to think, say one thing, put it on the table, question or a statement. I'm going to do the same thing. Okay. All right. So I haven't role played since my day in a, uh, in a classroom, probably like nine, <laughs> 10 years ago. Well, Craig, uh, it turns out I actually am uh, a director of clinical for my local pharmacy uh, department at a hospital of about 200 beds. So I'll start off by saying, um, you know, thanks for having me in today. I uh, really appreciate it. I know your time's so limited. Um, so I really want to hear from you. What do you want to see uh, in a rep right now? I'll tell you, after the last two years, anyone who can help us see around corners with supply levels is going to be the difference maker to us. So what is your approach typically when you're looking at products? What makes you go with one product over another? Everyone is optimizing to cost right now. Every SKU is analyzed. Every single purchase is justified. So when you're when you're looking at products, how much consideration goes into the human error that you typically see with having to take a bottle and, and break it down? How much consideration do you put into human error and um, human time as money? That's one of the pieces of information our value analysis framework uses, but it's always based on data. So what other data are you looking at? We tend to look at our own systems data because our own communication processes are pretty reliable, but we'll also consider studies as well. Okay. And what specific challenges have you run into when you're using your data to, to make these decisions? What challenges are you finding? I'm just going to pause us right there and congratulate you because I can see you walking through already this exact framework and asking me about my approach to data and what's happened and now what challenges we're on. This is really fantastic work. Just to play with you for a second, this is not a critique because you're amazing. I want you to back up and follow one of my clues, any clue in one of the statements I'm giving you. And instead of going to the next logical thing for you, make sure you explore that clue and see what happens. 
we have to justify every single thing. And we're doing uh, analysis line by line on each skew. What is it that you have to justify? Boom! Magic! All right. We have to justify this choice over that choice because the level of scrutiny we go through by the cost people over in supply chain is almost unbearable. What exactly is making it unbearable for you? We have a job to do and it's to save lives. And to be honest, a lot of that stuff, I'm just trying to deflect from the team because we need to be making the best decisions for our patients instead of trying to nickel and dime from our suppliers. Craig, let's pause there. What level of trust do you think we have if I'm willing to tell you something like that? Yeah, it's definitely not on that initial level anymore. It's starting to dive a little bit deeper. The only point I'd make to you is I think your strategy was great. Your execution was great. You were following a, a process very well. But when we look for the hot words and follow the clues, we can go much deeper, much faster and be working at another level. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Craig, it takes a um, brave soul to go first on something strange in front of a lot of people. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was really well done. Yeah, I made a fool out of myself for the past I, couple of years. You rocked it. You rocked also, it. Uh, I think it was great. No, Isaiah, thank you. Yeah, you bet. I, I think Craig got voluntold, by the way. It was, near, it was near the volunteer, but everyone just kind of took a step back. Mm, mm -hmm. It happens. It does happen. <laughs> I really am going to back to school night now, though. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Listen, I, I think I think it's so interesting, um, and thank you, Craig, I, Isaiah. Like the model that you're using, I'd love for us to to get that to Maria so that we can post it with the show notes so people can take a look at it. You know, it, it's this whole notion of like continuing to be of service to people, and the only way you can be of service to people is to be curious. To, to be empathetic and to continue to ask questions to build relationships so that you can actually be of value to people. And I think it's not pushing your agenda on other people. It's about how you can be of service to people. And when you do that, your ability to quote unquote sell, which is really to provide value to people, meet them where they're at, becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. People it, just it's simply abundant choose you. mindset. That's right. Absolutely. Because you're not transacting on them anymore. And now you're in a territory of trust where maybe it's this, maybe it's that, but you're building up the type of people you want to work with and the type of people who want to work with you for years to come. I agree a hundred percent. It's interesting. I'm going to pull this off my monitor. I have a, a question and I'm going to read it to you because it's, it's what I'm asking all of my clients this week. What would make this the can't miss most important hour of your week? Because mm. I spend an hour of time with all of my clients and I want to make sure that the value that I'm providing is the can't miss hour of their week. And that's the onus that I put on myself. I have to come and bring it every single day, every single hour that people entrust me and invite me inside their business. And I think that's the mechanism of like, for any, like no one misses meetings with me, right? And, and I'm so grateful for that. I think the last time someone missed a meeting was, was months ago. And it's because I think I bring value to what it is that they're doing. But I want to make sure that that's the case. And so I'm going to ask, I'm going to be vulnerable and ask what would make this the most can't miss hour of your entire week. And it's the same process that you're going through or anyone can go through to make sure that we all become the de facto supplier, mm -hmm. service provider, product provider of choice for every market vertical that we're in. I love you're saying that because I already know if I gave you these different scenarios, you do something different. If I said, Jerry, I just need a sense of relief. Oh. And you would say something like, okay, put your phone down, silence your notifications and email. Let's just talk about what's really going on. And you're not allowed to take notes today. 
right? Whereas if I told you I'm facing a real serious leadership issue and I need to figure it out, you do something completely different. And if I said I'm behind on my taxes, the person I thought was doing them didn't, and now I'm afraid I'm actually non-compliant with the law, you might say, okay, we're going to end this call right now. And I'm going to put you on the phone with this person that I know, and they're going to get you fixed up by the end of the hour, right? Which is to say somebody else has the value to provide today. All three of those you might do based on how I answer that question. Amen. Because it's not one size fits all. Mm -mm. And I don't believe that I have every answer to every question. Just like uh, I was on a call earlier uh, for office hours and someone was asking about, you know, some marketing stuff. And I said, I have the person for you. They happen to be in the family, you know, our family of companies. Let me put you in touch with them. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, I have to wait for our next round of funding. I said, no, 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 that's not the way we work. We, we help each other. We're part of the family. And so we look out for each other and we help each other. That's the magic of communities and doing these things together. And it's why I love um, doing best places to lead. So Love it. Yeah. Value creation is a mindset and it keeps paying rewards all over the Amen. place. Mm -hmm. Isaiah, you were amazing. This was like a, a clinic of building relationships and literally like down to the brass tacks of the types of questions to ask and open-ended versus close-ended and following the hot words so that you can mirror the relationship all the way through to build that commonality and that trust so that you can ask the question, listen, reflect, question, rinse and repeat. And you should get yourself on a positive spiral of building that relationship so that eventually they say, Isaiah, of course, I want to do business with you. And so I am grateful that you shared that with us all this time. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Friends. All right. We ran a little long, but I think it was worth it. So um, next week, I am going to present on communication in the digital age because the world has changed a whole lot from uh, the time that I started in business where we used to send faxes and now emails and now Slack, mes Slack messages and all of these things. And so I'm gonna walk through what communication in the digital age looks like and how we can do that better so that people aren't just hiding behind text messages and trying to communicate and close deals in channels that just don't make any sense. So next week, 3.30. And if you haven't joined us on Best Places to Lead over on our private Facebook community, I'd encourage you to find us best places to lead. We uh, ask questions, we answer questions, lots of interesting content that happens over there. I'd invite you to come join us there. And I am so grateful for all of you. It is humbling that people come and join us. And so until next week, I hope you guys have a great week. All right.